Hello, everyone. So my name is Ephraim Aliyu, and um, I'm a second year PhD student in Dr. Kanwan's lab. Um, so our lab is interested in exploring um, and developing novel technologies for plant genetic transformation. And today I'm happy to introduce Dr. Francisco Pinto Espinosa. Um, so Dr. Francisco holds a PhD from the University of Bonn and for the Junzentrum Jilich. And his doctoral research focused on um, remote sensing of photosynthetic efficiency using sun induced chlorophyll fluorescence obtained from hyperspectral imaging. Moreover, he is also the remote sensing specialist at the International Maze and Wheat Improvement Center in Mexico City. And Dr. Francisco is particularly interested in remote sensing techniques for feed phenotyping and understanding of ecophysiological dynamics of crops. Um, his other interests involve high throughput phenotypy approaches um, for improved genetic gain and implementing and integrating sensors for precision um, uh, agriculture. Um, Francisco's work has been published in several peer reviewed journals and is also a recipient of several awards like the DAAD PhD Scholarship, um, the University of Hanover Inter Exchange Scholarship, the Andes Foundation Scholarship, and in welcoming Dr. Francisco Pinoza, Espinoza as he gives us his presentation. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you very much, Ibrahim. I, I hope you are hearing me okay. And uh, I'm in full screen presentation mode, I guess. Please tell me if not, okay? So, um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here today. It's really an honor to have been contacted by you and uh, share my experience at CIMIT as a specialist in remote sensing for improve, for implementing high throughput phenotyping platform, especially in the WIT program. Um, so um, basically I will talk to you about our experiences, uh, our needs, and put you a bit in the context of what are we doing here in CIMIT. Um, okay. So for those, those of you that are not familiar with CIMIT, the, the acronym CIMIT stands for the Spanish name of the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. That is, uh, the headquarters are located in Mexico. CIMIT was funded in the 60s by the Nobel Prize laureate, Dr. Norman Borlaug, uh, and it has been acknowledged as one of the birthplace of the Green Revolution, when uh, Dr. Borlaug uh, developed dwarf and rust resistant wheat varieties that had caused a huge impact, especially in the developing world at that time. So since then, CMIT works mainly in the developing world, aiming at improving uh, the livelihood by promoting more productive and sustainable maize and wheat agri-system. And for that, uh, we have 13 regional offices in different countries. We have a project uh, covering over 40 countries and a broad network of collaborations with the developing and the developed world as well. So we have collaborations with the USA, with Europe, Japan, Australia, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, well, this picture will show you a bit the, the impact, the magnitude of the impact of CIMIT around the globe. So each spot here is showing you a collaborator or an institution that is receiving yearly uh, germoplasm from CIMIT. In red, in red, you will have the maize germoplasm distributed, and in blue, you have the wheat germoplasm. And he, it has been estimated that about 50% of the maize and wheat in the, grown in the developing world is based on CIMIT varieties. Now, from this image or this map, you will also see that CIMIT um, is breeding, targeting for a, a broad variety of environments. And that imposes, of course, uh, many challenges. So, especially nowadays, Breeding for a range, range of environments uh, is challenging because especially weather conditions are becoming more and more unpredictable. So we need to develop methodologies that enable us to have a better multi-environmental trials, you know, well characterizes and uh, reduce the errors associated with the trials and improve our selection accuracy. So now focusing a bit more on the spring wheat uh, breeding program, we have our starting point for breeding for different varieties in northern Mexico, more specifically in Ciudad Obregón, where I'm sitting right now. Uh, sometimes Ciudad Obregón and our experimental site is acknowledged as sort of la, the mecca of uh, spring wheat breeding, because uh, in this location, we have the opportunity to simulate different environments and breed for those environments. 
So we do breeding, pre-breeding and research activities targeting at geopotential environment. So we manage that with irrigation, targeting at drought, also manage, manageable with irrigation and heat. And the heat where environment, we achieve it by delaying the, the sowing time. Um, so in addition to that, we have a bunch of international research collaboration that uh, they have their hubs or their uh, experiments also here in Ciudad Obregón. And in addition, we have two other experimental sites in Central Mexico that allow us to have two cycles, two growing cycles in one year. So that speed up a bit the breeding process. But here only in Obregón, we have over 100,000 plots of different size covering of about 250 hectares that needs to be phenotyped. And it needs to be phenotyped for different purposes. So there is different kind of phenotyping. We have phenotyping for early selection, for disease resistant evaluation, physiological research, physiological breeding, exploration of genetic resources and, and progeny evaluation. If we look at the conventional breeding programs for uh, bread wheat and durum wheat, uh, well, there is no question that the phenotyping is the cornerstone of these uh, programs. And the main agronomic traits that they are um, evaluating usually in the geo trials or in their advanced trials and also in the early um, generations, it's basically yield, uh, thousand kernel weight, phenology, plant height, disease resistant, and biomass. Um, and to be able to phenotype that amount of trials as we have here in Obregon, uh, it's, there is a necessity of uh, improving the efficiency of phenotyping by using high throughput phenotyping technologies that would enable the direct estimation of these traits. But not only that, but we, we need approaches that also could contribute feeding uh, other approaches like genomic selection models that combine it to pe with pedigree or genomic information could help us to uh, for an early prediction no? and improving the accuracy for that early prediction. Um, well, the, the prediction claims that by the 2050, um, we need to increase considerably the yield of our crops. And if we continue at the current pace as the conventional breeding programs are doing, we won't be able to reach that. And that's why CMIP has been searching for um, uh, additional strategies of improving um, lands, no? improving weeds, especially uh, for improving it for adaptation to abiotic, abiotic stress and uh, geopotential. So we have developed what we call it the physiological pre-breeding, where we are targeting not mainly in geo, but we're targeting here secondary traits that would confer plants uh, adaptability to such a abiotic stress or under geopotential. And we have a well-defined pipeline for this physiological pre-breeding, starting with an idiotype uh, that we obtained by having a crop design or a conceptual model that and that model will tell us what are the limiting drivers of yield under a specific environment i will shortly explain that in details once we have this model and we identify what are the traits of interest you know what are the adaptive traits then we will move to the genetic resources available and we will screen for them by using phenotyping uh, approaches, and we will also do genetic analysis. By combining these two tools, um, then we will be able to select and design a strategic process that would search for boosting this uh, adaptive traits in the progeny with the final aim of trying to insert these new lines into the conventional breeding program so we get better uh, gains in, in genetic, uh, better genetic gains for deals, sorry. This progeny also has to be evaluated, of course, and it can re-enter this pipeline. Mm -hmm. So what I'm talking about genetic, uh, well, sorry, when I'm talking about conceptual models, um, we're focusing on those, what are the limiting factors of deals and what are the traits defining these limiter factors as well. Mm -hmm. So for example, under geo potential, we can very simply say that uh, yield is determined by the interception of light or light interception, the radiation use efficiency, and the harvest index. But in contrast, in, under drought, yield would be more um, limited by the water uptake, the water use efficiency, and the harvest index. So the exercise that we are doing 
and here I'm doing I'm showing you an example of the adapted trace that we have defined for a, for heat is that for each of these driver of GIL under that environment, we define a list of limiting factors and traits that potentially we can measure for selection for those environments. For example, radiation use efficiency under heat will be greatly determined by photoprotection mechanisms, and photoprotection mechanism in terms will be determined by pigment composition, down regulation mechanisms of photosynthesis, leaf morphology, etc. It will also be determined by the efficiency of certain metabolisms, such as CO2 fixation, photosynthesis and respiration, and also water use. So in the similar way, we define numbers of traits for each of these components. So we come with a list of those traits that are currently considered in a strategic process, and we do selection for those traits. We also perform research, of course. Um, to identify what are the more valuable traits and if we have genetic differences, so we could select eventually for those traits. So the evaluation of all these traits require certain numbers of tools for phenotyping uh, at different scales. So our group has dedicated for many years trying to identify, uh, validate and implement what are the best uh, phenotyping protocols, especially under field conditions. And we like to englobe all of this in what we call the breeders friendly phenotyping tools or breeding friendly phenotyping. And we um, classify this method in four big groups. We start with the handy visual phenotyping approach, which is basically the breeder or the scientist going across the field by doing visual scoring of phenology, canopy architecture, disease, pets, etc. And of course, this is a low resolution, uh, low throughput, but we should never underestimate the uh, uh, accuracy of a well-trained eye. So it's still very valid nowadays. If we move to a more technological side, we have the handy physiological traits and all these approaches basically use handheld devices, uh, off-the-shelf devices, not such as like the green seeker for estimation of NDVI or infrared thermometers for estimating canopy temperature. And they allowed a bit higher throughput and estimate some um, traits of interest, such as ground cover, green area, biomass, leaf greenness, and canopy temperature. If we move forward, we will have what we call the high throughput phenotyping approaches, and they make use of different platforms from the ground to the aerial or even at the space uh, scale, you know, using satellites. And those, they, um, well, I will explain this in details later, but they will focus more on the use of spectroscopy or thermal imaging or image analysis. And then finally, we have the precision phenotyping approaches that are those that make use of highly specialized devices and require certain expertise to accurately measure metabolic processes or uh, structures that cannot be measured usually in a high throughput mode. And this kind of traits have demonstrated their value for a strategic process. So allow me now to focus on the high throughput phenotyping uh, because, well, for us, the use of remote sensing and sensors for high throughput phenotyping offers many uh, advantages. First of all, they are non-invasive, and because they are non-invasive, it enables the multiple special temporal dimensions of observation. So we can observe all, how traits change over time and at different spatial scales as well. We can move from single leaf to a plot level, to the trial level, to the regional level, or to the global level if we want. Yeah? They are much faster than conventional phenotyping tools. They allow the systematic data collection. So that means that can reduce the errors and allows automation, which will have a huge impact in the accuracy, in the selection accuracy of our trials. And it can potentially be more cost effective. So from all these remote sensing and sensor tools or techniques, we can group them in four main groups that we are interested at CIMIT to implement and have them interconnected. Namely, those are spectroscopy, thermography, image analysis or data analytics, and uh, envirotyping. Very briefly on each of them, you can say spectroscopy, basically what we are measuring here is the leaf or the canopy reflectance, and the reflectance at different wavelengths will be determined by the composition of the vegetation or the canopy structure, uh, and that would give us uh, some characteristic 
spectrum for each genotype or each stress or each condition that the plants are in the field. And the way to use that spectrum is the most basic way to use it is by um, the so-called vegetation indices. Probably the most widely known is the NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which makes use of the reflectance of two different wavelengths in the red part of the spectrum and in the near, uh, near infrared part of the spectrum. And this index relates very much with the amount of greenness that we find in our vegetation. So that's why we can NDVIs usually relate to traits such as leaf area index, biomass, uh, the fraction of absorbed power, chlorophyll content, nitrogen content, etc. So in a similar way, we there are hundreds of different uh, indices, and you can still develop new indices by just combining uh, different reflectance of different wavelengths uh, with different formulas as well. But there are more complex ways of using the spectrum where you use the full spectrum signature uh, using um, statistical analysis, multivariable uh, statistical analysis and machine learning regressions. Then we have thermography. Um, well, the plants and the, meta the plant metabolism will interact with the environment at different levels, and many of these interactions would result in changes in canopy temperature or at leaf in, in, uh, on leaf temperature. And those changes in temperature will be reflected in changes on the infrared radiation, which is basically what we are measuring with thermography. Then we have methods for object identification and classification and the use of photogrammetry. And such a method allows us to identify objects, localize them, count them, classify them, and measure them. You know? and, in, uh, and, and, and we would use such a method for counting, for example, plants or counting spikes, counting cups, or estimating phenology by the appearance of certain organs. And the final group of approaches is envirotyping. I mean, this is super important that we need to characterize our environment, our field. Um, and we should start from the soil characterization, probably. So the map that I'm showing here is, the, is showing you the heter uh, heterogeneity that we find in our experimental field in uh, terms of electrical conductivity. Um, we have also weather stations in our site, but we should move forward for the more in deep characterization, maybe at the level of single tribes or even at the level of single plot characterizing the micro um, environment within the plot, but also move at the up, 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 upscaling these measurements no? to weather characterization of the regional, especially if we are moving towards uh, multi environment trials. So what platforms and sensors we have in our group for working in these four groups of uh, techniques or approaches for measuring the physiological traits that I mentioned and the agronomic traits in the breeding program. For a long time, we were working with UAVs and we managed to have quite decent fleet of UAVs and cameras uh, that would cover all the spectrum of different techniques from spectroscopy, thermography and image analysis or pattern recognition using RGB imagery. Uh, we also develop a semi-automatic approach uh, for the processing of the image and extracting the data at the, at the level of individual plot, including georeferencing our experiments. So we knew the exact coordinates of each of our plots and some in-flight calibration methodologies. Now, unfortunately, regulations for flying drones in Mexico have become more and more strict. And uh, recently we were grounded or flying drones in our experimental site just because we are surrounded by airfields. So why I'm telling you this? Because if you ever consider the use of drones for your breeding program or your experiments, you should consider local regulations. This is becoming more and more an issue. And uh, while the access of drones is becoming more, while drones are becoming more accessible, maybe regulation and making them more restrictable. And beside the, the frustration that this produced to us after investing so much time and money in this, uh, it was it also had a positive side because it pushed us to change uh, our platform. So we moved to an aircraft uh, and that was partly possible. Well, it was possible thanks to the cooperation that we have between um, um, colleagues here in CIMIT. So one colleague of mine, Francelino Rodriguez, he was using an aircraft for um, characterization of farms and they enable us to put uh, our sensors in the aircraft, and in the beginning, we were quite skeptical uh, if that would work because these sensors were done for uh, drones. 
So the resolution may not be enough, the data may not be so consistent, the sensor may not behave well. But fortunately, it started to behave very well. We are getting very meaningful data, and uh, this has become our core platform for uh, high throughput data. So uh, right now we are covering our fields in a very fast fashion. So while before for measuring canopy temperature in a big trial, we needed 30, 40 minutes. Now we are covering in one minute. And that means a lot in terms of reducing confounding effects. So imagine while you are measuring with the drone, a wind gust come to your field, it changed completely the temperature of your plots and ruins your measurements, or you will have to try to account for that noise in your analysis. Right now, by covering in one minute, one uh, trial, uh, you practically get rid of that noise. You know? So actually we have seen improving uh, heritabilities for canopy temperature by using the aircraft. So nowadays uh, we are working towards the automation of this uh, pipeline from the image acquisition to the, the delivery of final result. So we're working in collaboration with a private company, a French company called IFEN, that is processing our imaging. And we are not only obtaining vegetation indices from the multispectral cameras, but we are also getting canopy temperature from our thermal camera. Uh, they are doing some model inversion uh, for, uh, for measuring some biophysical properties of the vegetation, such as leaf area index or the fraction of that salt part. So this is the first year we are doing that, and we are uh, trying to validate those with ground truth data. And we have prospects of developing a model for estimation of biomass from this aerial uh, platform. Now, we didn't only move higher, but we also moved lower. And we started to uh, build some ground phenotyping, and I must say low cost phenotyping uh, platform. We started to build our pheno cards, very low cost, $400 cost one of these, plus the cost of the instrument. And we started with the use of a LiDAR system because we saw that some groups were doing interesting development in using LiDAR for estimation of biomass and the, the identification of some um, organs such as spikes. So we are currently working with them for implementing that system in our cards. Uh, what you, the images that you see here are from our fields. So now we are working in how to extract this data and make the best uh, estimation models. Together with the LiDAR, we are integrating other sensors. We are integrating our thermal cameras, our RGB cameras, and multispectral cameras, but they are giving us too much information that it's not worth the, uh, or it, it makes too complex the analysis. So we're moving to point sensors in a version 3.0 of our Peno card. And uh, these point sensors are cheaper and easier to handle. The data that they give is also easier to analyze. And uh, we are hoping to implement this in the card this year, where we will be measuring three plots simultaneously, and we will be able to cover big trials in a short time. We also move our RGB cameras down. So these pictures that you see on the left were taken with my personal camera that I mounted in the card. And the initial idea was to see if we can detect spikes. And the quality of the images are really satisfactory, and actually there have been uh, they, are, they started to be used in the Global Wheat Head Detection Challenge, which is a worldwide challenge for developing algorithms, deep learning algorithms to detect and count spikes. So, and the advantages of our images is that we collected data over different trials, um, different environments, and different phenological stages. So, they have a good data set of um, spikes there to train their models, and we're hoping to um, use those models very soon in our data. And we're also moving towards some more, more advanced technology. This is a collaboration that we have with a private partner that developed a high-tech prototype of a vehicle uh, that would use deep learning for estimation of some tra important traits. Now, unfortunately, this is a, co a confidential project, and therefore I cannot give you more details of what traits, what technology is using. But yeah, we are evaluating those uh, that prototype. What key Physiological traits have been evaluated using these different platforms and different techniques. Well, for a long time, we have been using RGB imagery for a very simple analysis of pixels and trying to estimate the ground cover of vegetation. So by just doing thresholding, you can mask out soil pixels and just estimate the amount of vegetation pixels, and that gives you a pretty good estimation of the ground coverage. 
Now, this uh, method works pretty well in our environment, but we are we are conscious that um, it may not robust to be expanded to different environments. So that's why the next step would be to train such a model using deep learning techniques. In a similar way, our colleagues from MACE are using RGB imagery to uh, count kernels in, um, in MACE uh, pops and also um, estimate some kernels attributes by using the images analysis. With RGB cameras mounted in, in drones, we were able to do photogrammetry and reconstruct the 3D model of our canopies of our plots. And this is a work performed by Leonardo Volpato, a PhD student, who was trying to estimate plant height at different phenological stages with quite good results, quite good uh, accurate estimation of plant height. So we are able with this te technique to um, evaluate, first of all, growth rate across the cycle and also to select for plant height. And uh, this methodology has good prospect for estimation of biomass as well, if we use the point cloud and the volume of the plot. So this is something we are testing. Another important trait for us is radiation use efficiency. Radiation use efficiency is a key trait, uh, especially under yield potential. So Carlos Robles, who is this PhD student here, he was testing different approaches, different devices, platforms, and um, techniques to get the best prediction models of radiation use efficiency and its components. The components of radiation use efficiency is bio, are biomass accumulated and the intercepted part accumulated over a specific time. And what he observed is that the best predictions for intercept, intercepted part were obtained by using green or chlorophyll related indices such as the NDVI. And and that was quite robust across different growth stage, and that's quite makes sense uh, because the more chlorophyll you will have, more uh, absorbed part it will be. Yeah? The estimation of biomass, uh, for the estimation of biomass, he started to observe some changes in the traits that were needed for the best models. So we have already kind of the temperature and, and some indices related to water content. And in fact, other works in our group has shown that water normalized difference water indices are correlate, correlate very good with biomass production. Uh, finally, for this direct estimation of radiation use efficiency that show better results than estimating each component separately, makes use of a good combination of all these traits. So it uses canopy temperature, spot meters, so it's relation to, related to chlorophyll content, and also water index for the, break, uh, for the vegetative part of the crop. We did similarly, uh, we test this also in another trial, but only focused in NDVI canopy temperature and water index for estimating biomass uh, 12 days after heading and final biomass with quite good results for each of these um, traits. But the best results were obtained where we were combining all these traits together in a single uh, model. Now, of course, we are perfectly aware that this can be a case of overfitting, especially considering that this is a low population. So the next step in this work is to try these models and this approach in a larger population that we have better characterized. Namely, we have a, a high VAP panel where we are measuring constantly uh, aerial biomass. Canopy temperature is another important trait. Uh, across the years, we observe all the time a very close negative relation, correlation between canopy temperature and grain yield under drought and heat stress. So cooler plants tend to produce higher yields uh, in wheat. Yeah? And this is related to the time that uh, stomata are open or the, the, the capacity of plants to keep the stomata open in uh, facing a drought or a heat condition. But not only that relations we observe. We also observe that canopy temperature closely re relates to uh, root depth. So we observe that those genotypes under heat and drought that were able to explore deeper in the soil, they showed lower canopy temperature. So we took this principle and we, well, we tried to develop a, a an index based on, on aerial measurements of canopy temperature to see if we can phenotype for root capacity. Now, normally, phenotyping for root is labor intensive. You have to dig a root and it will never be so high throughput phenotyping. So if we are able to measure root capacity by canopy temperature, that would improve the throughput of root phenotyping. 
And the hypothesis was the, as following. So if we have two genotypes with similar aerial biomass, but two uh, different root biomass, and we allow them to grow under geo potential, and then we evaluate, we measure canopy temperature 12 days after heading where most of the uh, roots stop growing, we will see that since there is no limitation in water, we won't see differences in canopy temperature between these two genotypes, right? Now, if in another trial, we allow them to grow as max, uh, we allow the roots to grow at maximum potential uh, after heading plus 12, and then we subject the plants to a gradient of water deficit in time, we may start to see that the plants with lower root capacity or lower root biomass started to be warmer, you know, because we won't, they won't be able to match the needs of the evaporate, evaporate transpirative needs you know, of the field. And we will start seeing differences in canopy temperature. Similarly, if we put another trial, but this time we saw it later and we subjected the trial to increasing BPD, these differences in root capacity will also manifest in differences in canopy temperature. So we did the experiments, three trials with 10 lines, we repeated across years. And well, first of all, we observed, well, we defined root capacity very simply as root biomass and also as the root shoot ratio. And we observed that only for the VPD environment, we observed a significant and close association of roots function with final yield, uh, especially when we look at the deeper roots, 60 to 90 centimeters. We didn't observe that association for the upper roots, you know, for the first 30 centimeters. And also there was not a significant association for the yield potential. And curiously, we didn't observe also that for the drought uh, uh, experiment, as we would have expected. Nevertheless, we continue trying, we, we put we try to estimate now root biomass and root shoot ratio using canopy temperature. And we see that for the high VPD environment, we get very, very strong associations between canopy temperature. And also if we combine canopy temperature and water index, so we get quite good predicted prediction models here. Um, while for the drought environment, those predictions or those correlations were quite rather low and they only start to increase once we started the, the drought treatment, but at the first, at the roots of the first 30 centimeters. Now, interestingly, in the control, we also observe quite some high correlation. So this data that we are still analyzing or trying to understand, but we are quite confident that here we are very close to developing uh, such a remote sensing index for root phenotyping, at least for root capacity. Uh, very briefly, this is not, my the, on the realm of my expertise genomic selection but i told you that we were doing phenotyping not only for um direct estimation of different traits but also to fit genomic selection models so this is the work performed by my colleague philomene juliana and she's trying different genomic selection models based on genomics and the pedigree and a few works have shown that the incorporation of uh, remote sensing data such as NDVI it helps to improve these genomic selection models. And in fact, the best prediction she obtained was when combining the pedigree information with the NDVI. Um, so as a follow up for this uh, research, we are continuing. We need to be consistent collecting data year after year because it needs to be multi year uh, analysis. And then we are trying to also to characterize better the environment to characterize better the G by E interaction. So what is next for us? We have a lot of uh, ongoing development and a wish list. So we are working in automation and upscaling of our routine aerial measurement um, and also our ground-based uh, imaging system. And we are trying to implement deep learning algorithms here for counting, detection, and localization of organs and plants. And we are trying also to improve our environment characterization, which is very important. In parallel, we are doing some technical advances in terms of calibration and validation of the method, uh, automatic image processing, data quality check, and data management, very important. We are generating terabytes of data every cycle, and it's important to keep it tidy. Um, so what are the parameters or traits that we would like to measure? We are, well, as you saw, biomass is very important. Roots is also very important. It's not listed here. 
structural traits such as um, canopy architecture would be also of interest for us. Water use efficiency, we haven't explored much for that, but the use of canopy temperature has a great potential. Radiation use efficiency goes together with biomass and the yield potential, especially. Phenology, we are hoping that deep learning will allow to, will help us to detect spikes, for example, that will be re very relevant for breeders, spike density for uh, yield component estimation, and disease screening and early detection. And, and I left this last slide. Um, there are challenges. Now, the, ch the challenge in the future is not only to look into our experimental field. So at the moment, what I show you is what we are doing here at this level, you know, from leaf to the crop level using these platforms. But considering the wide range of environments that we need to select for, uh, and we need to do multi-environment trials to understand the G by E by the management component as well uh, for a better selection accuracy, uh, we need to start looking at the uh, greater scales, you know? So we need to start considering phenotyping at regional levels where we have different trials, for example, in different locations, or even at the global scale. So there are some tools, like for example, the use of satellite images may become very handy. And in fact, we are exploring the capacity of very high resolution satellite imaging for phenotyping our populations that are distributed with the collaborators and that they are grown under different environments or different conditions and that we usually are limited of, for collecting phenotypic data. So we're looking forward exploring these possibilities uh, because we need to increase data collected in our populations from different environments. So with that, I would like to acknowledge my team, the Wheat Physiology Group led by uh, Matthew Reynolds, the Global Wheat Program uh, team, for durum wheat and red wheat and the sustainable in intensification program team. And also I'd like to thanks to our donors. Thank you very much.